All right. And so let's talk about the fifth commandment. So that is found in Exodus 20, verse 13. Simple enough. You shall not murder. Um, hang on a second. Let me grab my catechism. I set it down. So, Luther says, what does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead help and support them in all of life's needs. So, if we're not supposed to harm our neighbors and we're not supposed to do anything but help them, does this commandment mean the death penalty isn't okay? And that is a question. So what do you think? I remember reading one of my mother's magazines when I was nine years old, and they invited people to write in and tell if they felt that the death penalty was okay or not. And at, at nine years old, I wrote in and said, absolutely not, and nothing anyone ever says will change my mind. Any other thoughts? You come on, it's a simple commandment, right? You shall not murder. And it's caused a lot of conflicted thinking on both sides. Yeah. And that conflicted thinking continues tonight. So, um, as you are all aware, we are the Lutheran Church. We are named partially as an insult. Um, after the person who broke away from the Catholic Church. Stephen, you believe an eye for an eye? And pretty soon the whole world is blind. Yeah. Um, so Luther did not want the church named after him. He actually wanted it to be called the, the Evangelical Church, but it got nicknamed Lutheran and it stuck. So even though we're named after Luther, and even though we consider him a great teacher in our church, we don't necessarily agree with everything that Luther said. Even the Book of Concord, which is that big book I showed you with all the writings in it, even the writers in there, even, you know, half of it is Martin Luther, but a lot of the writings in there don't always agree in every particular with him. And some of the reason is because of what he said about this commandment. So in the large catechism, Luther writes quite a bit about this, and he kind of ties himself into bows because on the one hand, he wants to protect uh, the people and have them live in right relationship with one another. But on the other hand, he doesn't want to anger the prince elector who's protecting him right now and keeping him from being put to death by the Roman church. So he comes up with this interesting little thing where he says, the death pen, or he says, you shall not murder is a commandment meant for regular people. So everybody on this, on this Zoom meeting, we should not murder anybody. However, this commandment does not apply for some reason to the state, to the government, because they have the ability to do that they have ability to hand out punishment according to their own needs. Okay, so a lot of people disagree with that, and I can see why, because Luther is essentially tying himself in knots trying to get around this. And then he goes on to explain it a little bit further, never coming back to the idea that government shouldn't be able to do this. He just accepts it as a fact that government should be able to, to engage in the death penalty or really anything. Um, this comes back to bite him later. There is something called the Peasants' Revolt, um, where basically people get really excited about the, the things that Luther has said and these freedoms, and they start to feel like maybe they shouldn't be these oppressed peasants who have to work all the days of their lives for nothing, 
while these aristocrats sit around in, in palatial estates and, you know, they start to think there's something wrong with that. So they engage in a revolt and the aristocracy puts them down very, very violently. And Luther actually writes a tract against them and essentially gives the government permission to put them down. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those things that I really wish Luther hadn't gotten involved in, but... Well, if we had a statue of Luther, we could pull it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you'd like to do that, there is a statue of Luther at the seminary. Um, <laughs> so but that's, that's what's happening today. I mean, we're bringing up things that... <clears throat> we don't look at the good people do. Well, I won't say we, but people are not looking at the good that people do or have done. They're only looking at the bad, which may have been a small portion of their life. That's the way I look at it at any rate. Yeah, and I, I get that on some people. I think it depends on who we're talking about. You know, there, like there was a statue in England that got pulled down and it was a guy who was a slave trader. Um, you know, he may have done good things in his life, but he, he did good things with the money he got from selling people. So they probably shouldn't have a statue of him. Um, I think other people are more complicated, but that's kind of a sidebar thing. But by the same token, the man that wrote Amazing Grace was a slave trader. Yeah, but if you know anything about me, you already know that I don't really like that song, so... <laughs> yeah, <I do. laughs> it's got nothing to do with the writer it's got everything to do with the fact that it doesn't get around to mentioning god until the last verse and i have a problem with that um you know who are you singing to for four verses i don't know um anyway so this honestly is not even the worst thing that luther does um some of his later writings some of the ones that um were intentionally not translated into English when Fortress Publishing and Concordia got together in the 70s to translate them, um, were very, very nasty towards Jews. He essentially hated the Jews for not converting wholeheartedly to, to Lutheranism. Um, he, he didn't have much use for, for Muslims, but he did think that if the Muslims were to come up into Europe and take out the papacy, then that would be just great. Um, so, yeah, Luther was a, he was a man of his times and he was a conflicted person because he could write beautiful things about how to love your neighbor and then turn around and, and do exactly the opposite of the things he's, he said. So, simultaneously saint and sinner. Um, yeah. So we take the good with the bad. In any case, um, Luther goes on in this commandment to talk about how not murdering doesn't just mean don't kill somebody. Okay, Not murdering extends all the way to, you know, wishing somebody ill, you know? So if, if you know, okay, maybe you don't kill somebody, but if you say, well, I'd like to kill that person, that is essentially to Luther the same thing as doing it. And he's arguing that it's the same thing to God. Um, if you, you know, look at somebody and say, well, I wish they'd fall down a set of stairs, you know, you're wishing them ill. And so you're essentially wishing them harm and, and you're murdering them at least mentally. You're, you're wishing them ill. I think it stretches it a little bit. Um, Although didn't didn't Jesus say if you did this in your heart you did it? Yeah, hang on one second. What's the matter, Alexis? Well, if you just go call for mommy, you're going to be out of luck because she's in the shower. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, and and Luther points back to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you know, you should not murder, and he he teaches on this. Um, it's hard to take this commandment and teach this to confirmands who are 
13, 14, sometimes 12, and say, you know, you shall not murder means you should not even talk bad about somebody because that's the same thing. Um, it is something for us to aim for. It is the ideal way to be is to not wish ill of anybody. Um, but it's very hard to get there. Um, yeah, I'm a pastor. I'm not there. Okay, when I get cut off in traffic, I, I don't wish somebody dies, but, you know, do I wish they, like, get a flat tire or, you know, <laughs> or the blue lights would light up in just a minute after them? Yeah, of course I do. So, um, so what are your what are your thoughts on this one? Another thing in there too isn't there something about uh, like the things you don't do that you could do to help your neighbor? The yeah. neglect or the um, the negative things. Yeah. So Luther would say that if you have the ability to help somebody and you don't do it, then you've caused them harm. And so you've essentially killed them, which is, you know, it's at the very least, it's very convicting because if you think that because you didn't, you know, give somebody a $5 bill in the parking lot when they ask, you killed them, it becomes harder to not give them that five bucks. Um, you know, and that may not be particularly what Luther had in mind, but the, the concept holds, you know, as Christians, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be focused on helping others, caring for people, showing love like Jesus did, you know, Jesus, when somebody came to Jesus for help, Jesus didn't check them out. Jesus didn't ask a bunch of questions. Jesus just gave them what they needed. Um, and that is hard for us to do because we're skeptical and we think people are trying to play us, but it's what we're called to do as Christians. We hear about it in the gospel lesson this week, you know, when Jesus feeds the 5,000. So what other thoughts on this one? But Jesus gave them what they needed because he knew what they needed, and sometimes we don't. This is true. If we give them $5 and they go um, buy something that they end up killing themselves with, have we killed them twice? <laughs> no, because you gave them the $5. They killed them. Okay, but that did them harm. <laughs> right, but you can't control what somebody else does. No, but we're not Jesus, and we don't know what they need. Get out and go. Uh, no, we're not Jesus, and we can't know everybody's heart. That's why our default position, at least for me, my default position is just to do it and let God sort it out. You know, if I can help somebody, I'm going to help them. If they go use that money like they shouldn't, I can't help them. But I at least know that I am able to to try and be neighborly and, and love them as much as I can. You know? Well, I would have to qualify that. If you know a person is going to use what you hand them to go buy drugs or a, bo a, a bottle, then you're wrong to hand them the money. I would agree with that, but I'm talking, I'm not talking about somebody that I know and have knowledge of. I'm talking about like a random person I've never mm -hmm. met on the street. I have no idea what that person is going to do. So I can't say one way or the other, and I'm not going to try to be a judge of them. I'm just going to try to help. If it's somebody that I have knowledge of and I know what they're going to do, I think that's a different situation. Okay. Well, yeah, because it does say we should avoid, you know, someone that's going to abuse their body with substance that harm them or their mind if we know that's what they're going to do with it. Yeah. Stephen, you asked a question a second ago. What about war? What about what? What about war? Are we talking about mm -hmm. the, the murder question then? Mm -hmm. See, this would go back to what Luther says, that governments have the right to kill someone. In which case, in the cases of war, you get sent to do the government's bidding and 
so you're you're killing because the government has said that the the cause is just um, there's a, a whole body of theology on this called the just war theory which Augustine came up with uh, 2,000 years ago and I struggle with it quite a bit because you know I was in the Navy do what? Go ahead. I mean, I was I was in the Navy, so I had to be prepared to do this kind of stuff, but I didn't like it. So, what were you going to say, Barb? The, the death penalty, to me, falls in this, well, the government is doing it. it it's a just cause because they're not fit to to live among us. To me, it's similar to war. I think Luther would agree with you. Um, I struggle with that quite a bit because there are inequities in our justice system. And so there are people who are much more likely to get the death penalty than others. And so I have a problem with us saying these people are not able to be returned to society or in any way reformed but these people who have committed the same crimes are it you know if we're going to have justice then justice should be the same across i agree it's it's injustice i agree with that yes linda i see it, what is I, it? I have a personal thing on this um my brother-in-law actually went to prison for murder and uh, he was released after only five years and never committed any other type of crime the rest of his life, which was decades. Um, I don't know that his situation was much different than a lot of other people who did end up with the death penalty. I mean, I think this is a this is the beginning of a much bigger discussion, just because, you know, in this country we talk about criminal justice and um, helping people make amends for what they do. You know, uh, theoretically, our our prison system is supposed to reform people. The reality is that they don't try to do that. They don't try to help anybody they just allow them to sit in these pens and then they get this graduate level education in criminal activities. And when they get out, they can't get a job because they have a record. And so they use the graduate level education they've gotten to go do more crime because it's the only way they think they can survive. So if we're never going to actually become a society that tries to reform people and forgive them for what they've done, and help them lead better lives, then we're just going to create the same vicious circle over and over and over, you know. And and Luther would say this is this is what this commandment comes down to. If we're just locking people away and saying, okay, you know, the heck with you, then we're not helping our neighbor. We've essentially killed them. Well, I heard one pastor tell me in connection with the death penalty that one reason he didn't believe in it was because you never knew if that person might be converted to Christianity and and perhaps even do good things. Yeah, I'm, I mean, that kind of has evangelizing overtones. I can, I can see that. Um, I think the biggest reason I struggle with the death penalty is because it feels like we're taking justice into our own hands to the ultimate level. Um, I don't know. It's a hard place to be in because there's some criminals that like pedophiles really bother me. 
But even mm -hmm. then, I don't know. You know, if you kill them, yeah, you've ended the problem, but you haven't fixed anything. You know, there's always going to be more. It seems like we could spend more energy on trying to figure out why they act like they do and figure out how to help people like that. And then we could actually stop the problem. Well, the man that was put to death late a uh, couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. the last thing he said, and, and it disturbed me, was I did not do it. Yeah. And you're killing an innocent man. What yeah. he said. You know, I don't know if he's telling the truth or not, but you would think if you were if you were about to be put to death, you would tell the truth at that last minute. Yeah. And I mean so it, there there are numerous numerous cases of people who have been put to death who years later we found out they really were innocent. You know? So if we're not doing our due diligence there, then how do we keep doing it? I know some people have argued too that in, in the Bible it says that um, that justice should come swiftly, but nobody's on death row anymore that hasn't been there for 20 years, so it's still not swift justice. Yeah. And I think that families who think that uh, killing someone else is going to bring them closure are sadly disappointed. And I've thought about this seriously. What if somebody heinously murdered Emily? The only way I'd believe in the death penalty is if it would bring Emily back. And it doesn't. It doesn't change anything. I mean, everybody. Everybody's going to have a different opinion on it. You kind of have. This is one of those things that you kind of have to work out with yourself, because unfortunately, Lutheranism sometimes doesn't give clean answers. You know, just like Christianity doesn't. You know, Luther worked very hard to make this opaque. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that was a fun one, right? <laughs> you want to throw? What? Do you want to throw abortion no. in there? Do what? You want to throw abortion in there? No. Mm -hmm. no. I I I don't want to wade into that debate, especially because I don't have the ability to do one. So. Um, because I can't carry a child, so. Um, anyway. Well, euthanasia and suicide falls under that same thing. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, ironically, I actually would be okay with assisted suicide. Like, if I know I'm, it's just going to be bad, give it a pill. I'm done. Bye. You know, but. Yay! <laughs> well, right. last thoughts on this one. The the last thing he the, in this little book it says, help him, your neighbor, in all his physical needs, and that goes along with you shall not kill, you shall help him if you can. And I think that's a side of this that is not commonly practiced. I know I don't practice it. Uh, even when I was younger and could do things, I was more inclined to let other people run their own business and I stayed out of their business. Yeah. Well, Bob and I used to try to help people and got burned many times, <laughs> many times. Yeah, I mean, I got, when I was on internship, you know, my internship congregation had uh, gift cards and, you know, we would give them to people to help them get food and stuff like that. And my supervisor jumped on me one day because when I was in the office, my policy was that they came and asked, you gave it to them. And apparently it was a repeat offender and, and he had caught them buying alcohol with the gift card one time. I didn't know. This was like two years before I got there and he jumped down my throat and 
he learned very quickly that that's not a good idea because um, I don't respond well to that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I understand it's, it's easy to get burned when you help somebody. That's the frustrating thing about Christianity. It doesn't, it doesn't always allow us to, to go with the choice that makes sense because God's love doesn't always make sense. Well, the sad part is, is you could be helping a fellow Christian and get burned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. That's a sad, that's the truth, well, but it's sad. And, well, and this is the, so like Rosie and I were talking about this the other day. Um, security officers, people whose job it is to protect people and to, to protect the country and stuff. You know, the first thing they'll tell you is, is the reason they're suspicious of everybody is because the only people who can hurt you are the people you trust. So, you know, those are the ones who can get you the, the fastest. It's a bad thing. You wish that everybody would live by the commandments and everybody would be fine. But if we did, <laughs> then we'd be in heaven and there'd be no point in talking about this. So. Well, that's why you mentioned the pedophiles and that's why so many young people that were sexually abused were abused by family members because they trusted them. Yeah. Which is really sad. It is. All right. So are we ready to move to the next one? Can I, can I just say one more thing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I apologize. I just wanted to bring up um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and um, what he did and, and how that applies to, you know, shall not kill. Yeah. Because I, 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 I was behind that. <laughs> not literally. I wasn't born then, but you know what I mean. So if you, if you don't know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a German Lutheran during World War II, um, extremely smart guy, um, wrote quite a bit and um, was eventually executed by the Nazi regime, not because of him speaking out, but because he was involved in a plot to kill Hitler. So, um, yeah. I, I think in his particular case, he was convinced at that point that Hitler was such a threat to the world that the only good that could come of him is if he died. Um, I think overall that was the right decision, but he, he still probably stepped outside of the commandment to do that, to, to make that decision. Um, Does that fall under go forth and sin boldly for grace is abundant? Yeah. But the idea of, of doing that is not necessarily to, to – when Luther says sin boldly, he doesn't mean go do whatever you want. He means go forth and do your best, but realize you're going to fall down. Um, so I think what Bonhoeffer did was he fell back on the idea that if he was able to achieve this, he was doing the most good for the most people. Um, because he would be helping his neighbors by keeping them from suffering. And that's where this commandment gets really complicated, you know, because you can essentially keep the commandment and violate the commandment all in the same action. Right. So, yeah. Well, another example, sort of, are, are the war crimes that we punish the Nazis for the millions of Jews that they killed. Six and a half million. Yeah. And see, I, I, I have a problem with not thinking that's right. Yep. I really have a problem with that. Well, we didn't punish as many as you think. A lot of them escaped Argentina. That's right. And every now and then we find one. Yeah, I found one in Canada a while back. So they won't right. find any more. They have to be dead shortly. Yeah. Let's move to the sixth commandment. This is the fun one. <laughs> so the sixth commandment, Exodus twenty verse fourteen: You shall not commit adultery. 
So, Luther's explanation. We are to fear and love God so that in matters of sex, our words and conduct are pure and honorable, and husband and wife love and respect each other. Sounds nice, right? Well, when you look into the large catechism, you find out that Luther thinks this means quite a bit more than that. Um, his definition of adultery is essentially anything that could, in thought, word, or deed, cause your neighbor's wife or daughter or female friend to in any way be dishonored. So this, of course, includes adultery because you would dishonor your neighbor by doing that. You would dishonor yourself um, and you would dishonor your neighbor's wife. So everybody would be dishonored. Um, but it also includes, well, you got to actually get up here if you want to get up here. But it also includes everything from um, committing adultery to thinking about committing adultery, or even having um, thoughts that are not pure about someone else. So looking at somebody in the store and thinking they're pretty could technically be considered adultery because you could be fantasizing about them and then cause them dishonor in thought. Um, so a very difficult commandment to explain to 13 and 14 year olds who spend all of their time doing exactly what we just said you shouldn't do. Um, yeah. So, um, what are you doing? Okay. So the book that we have, this book right here, tries to keep things kind of nice. Um, so talks about how the body is the finest creation of God's creations. And, you know, it's meant to bear physical life into the future. And so God wants us to have companionship and, and right relationships. And so God institute this commandment to make sure that we have these right relationships. Um, and, and also um, goes on to talk about intercourse and things that are just fun to talk about in a church setting. Um, yeah. So one of the things that comes out in this commandment in Luther's explanation of it, Lu remember Luther was a monk for a long time. Okay. He became a monk after he got scared during a lightning storm and abandoned being a lawyer and made his dad real mad. Um, he became a monk and got ordained and was a teacher at Wittenberg um, all before the Reformation started. It's, it's his time as a teacher that causes the Reformation to happen. By the, point, by the time he writes this, he has been not a monk for a while and has been married to Catherine um, for four years. So at this point, he, he kind of has a very different mindset about celibacy and being a monk. And he spends a lot of time talking about how you cannot become pure by devoting yourself to celibacy because you cannot ever stop having fantasies, no matter what people say. So he talks about how, you know, this idea that priests should be celibate or that monks should be celibate is ridiculous. It has no bearing in God's word and that they should, they should immediately go find somebody to marry. So I think it's a little hard to separate Luther's reasoning on this from his frustration at what he experienced during his time in the monastery. Um, I think there's definitely some, some bleed through here. And this is as much him trying to be faithful to the text as it is him bringing some of his own personal experiences in and getting a little carried away at times. Um, yeah. So, what questions or thoughts do you have about this? Not nearly as many as murder, evidently. Say again. 
not nearly as many as murder, evidently. Yeah, clearly. Mm. Well, there's a good bit in the Bible about divorced people and and adultery. And I'm a divorced person that remarried. And a lot of it is very confusing to me. Well, so there's a, I think it appears in all the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, but it, particularly in Mark, um, Jesus comes down pretty hard on divorce because he says you cause the woman to commit adultery when you marry somebody who's been divorced. But if you actually look at that passage, what Jesus is trying to say there is not specifically don't get divorced. He's saying that divorce came about because people are broken, because there's evil in the world and because there's sin in the world. And so relationships can't always be what God intended them to be. So Jesus is not necessarily saying never get divorced. Jesus is saying that you should, as much as you can, strive for those relationships that God meant to be sustaining, to be sustaining. When they're not, when you're being abused or when something terrible is going on, you should, as a beloved member of God's creation, get as far away from that situation as you possibly can. Um, does that make sense? Does to me. <laughs> but I was, I was raised that you got married to stay married. And that's, that's God's think... intention for marriage. But God is, you know, I, I would like to say that God is a realist. God realizes that there's evil in the world, there's sin in the world, and that even if God wants that, people are not always going to be able to hold up to that because people are broken. Stuff happens. But I stayed in a relationship for five years because I did not want to admit that it was broken. And it was not a good relationship. And, and, and I don't think people should, I'm afraid that today some of the opinion is, well, I'll get married. If it don't work out, I'll, I'll quit. I don't like that opinion at all. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the things that Jesus is pushing back against. Because it was, it was kind of common back then, too. You know, if you wanted a divorce in Jesus' day, you went and wrote a certificate of divorce and handed it to the lady. And it could be for any reason. It didn't matter. You just said, okay, done with you. There you go. Which and then you moved on and you went and did what you wanted, but she wasn't allowed to do anything. She was a possession and you just disowned a possession. It was, it was a bad thing, really. You're right about that. Isn't it still that way in the Jewish culture that the um, man can withhold um, letting his ex-wife move on? I think it depends on which, because see, there's three different types of Judaism now. There's Orthodox Judaism, there's conservative, and then there's reformed. So in reformed Judaism, I think that's been reformed. Um, in Orthodox Judaism, it probably is still the same. You know, Orthodox Judaism is the same one that says on the Sabbath, you can't even flip on the light switch. So. Stephen, you were you said something a minute ago about if all this is true, we wouldn't be here from all the begot in the Bible. Can you say more about that? Just so I kind of understand what you're saying. We wait while Stephen types. <laughs> At least he's here. Yep. <laughs> Rosie wants you to know she's here too, but she's on the couch. Hi, Rosie. So everyone was sleeping with their maidservants and so on. So yeah, everybody was, and it caused a whole lot of problems. There's a reason that, that you know, the Israelites kept getting hauled off to different places and, and turned into slaves and everything else. It's because they generally had a really hard time listening to what God said. Um, you know, we haven't gotten much better. 
we don't listen very well a lot of the time either. Um, especially if it doesn't conform with our neat version of Christianity that that's, you know, everything in its right place. Um, and I would point... Well, these... Go ahead. These commandments were written in Exodus, the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And yet it was very common to have concubines and to take your slave and it was an accepted thing the way I read the Bible. Oh yeah, it was accepted among the people, not necessarily among God. If you remember when David goes after uh, Bathsheba, who is uh, one of his general's wives, he commits adultery with her. He kills the general, commits adultery with her. They have a kid, the kid dies. And this is, this is in scripture, God's punishment for David's sin. David was still beloved by God. Yes. The child, unfortunately, not so much. So. Because God is a forgiving God. Yeah. But yet he punished the child and the child didn't do anything. Well, the question then would be whether God actually punished the child. Because if what Paul says is true, that the dead are with Christ in whatever way that is, then the child actually didn't suffer. The child just went from almost being born to being with Christ. What? So the child went from being born to being with Christ. There was no suffering about it. Well, two, I mean, what type of life would that child have had if it would have gotten the chance to grow up? I mean, think about it because of that, that, circumstances surrounding it I mean he probably would have been shamed well maybe I don't think so. but I mean if you're King David's kid you're probably not gonna probably not a good idea to shame King David's kid <laughs> especially, especially not when he's already knocked off a general so he could have the kid's mom I don't think he's gonna be all that fussed about somebody who's just random picking on his kid at school um their whole family is going to disappear. So, so, um, one other example I'd point to is is Abraham um, when he gets, well, really he and Sarah get too anxious about when this kid is coming that they're supposed to have, and so Abraham goes in there and lays down with her servant and has Ishmael. Um, and that doesn't work out very well, um, because, you know, the Muslim faith claims Ishmael is their, their founding, uh, ancestor. So that's why they claim Abra lineage with Abraham. They say that Ishmael went to that part of the world and it eventually became Islam after Muhammad had his visions of the cave. So... I didn't know that. So, yeah. So, this falls, I mean, we've talked about how the first three commandments are all about your relationship with God. The last seven are all about your relationship with your neighbor. And so, it, it kind of moves outward. So, um, the the fourth commandment and the fifth commandment are about most direct relationships with others. Um, and then the sixth commandment starts to move out a layer. So now we're talking about your neighbor and your neighbor's wife. And then as we move further, it's gonna move out into a gradually wider ring to where we get to the eighth commandment and we're talking about like everybody all over the place and how you're supposed to treat them all the time. Um, there's a lot of sense and order to how this is laid out even if it becomes very difficult to keep all the commandments. And these are just the 10 that we talk about. You know, Leviticus is full of commandments. 
Um, so you can rapidly see how hard it would be to keep God's law. You know, there's so many things that you have to do to be righteous that it's a good thing Jesus came. So. All right. So questions about the sixth commandment. These two were, I knew these two weren't be, wouldn't be very fun commandments, but they're necessary too. So no fun Hebrew, no charts, Greek, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'd say as many termites as Christ community today has, I could literally say that they ate my papers. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little surprised we still have hymnals. Um, yeah. You know, church made out of wood, somebody would cancel termite bond. What? Yeah, that's forward thinking. Hmm. When was that done? That was done uh, four or five years before they became Christ Community, um, when they were still Lutheran. Um, it was done in an effort to save money. Hmm. Yeah. So apparently, yeah. They, apparently they knew they had termites a long time ago, but the pastor, the pastor ran things and he didn't ever authorize treatment. He sprayed them with bug spray once. I gather they're not well off financially. No. Um, to say the least. Yeah. There's there's reasons for that. Poor leadership is at the top of the list. Um, so we'll probably have to seek a loan from Lutheran Men in Mission because um, they provide zero interest loans. And then try to figure out how to do a capital campaign with the people that we have and also how to get more people in there to become involved, if not financially, at least through their time and talents. So, yeah, it's going to be tough, but it'll be worth it in the end. You didn't think it'd be easy, did you? I was hoping it would be easier than this. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I accepted the call, nobody said anything about termites. <laughs> Not uh, never once mentioned. Um, well, I, I know that uh, we've already committed our August cause of the month to be uh, the uh, St. Stephen's uh, small, town small town restoration. Yes, yes. Uh, couldn't think of the name of it, but uh, I'm going to suggest to the council most of whom are on here, uh, that somewhere between now and the end of the year, we consider our sister congregation as a cause of the month, too. And they would, they would appreciate that because, you know, it's going to be, I can actually show you if you haven't seen it on Facebook. Hang on a second. Come back, mouse. <laughs> All right, so can y'all see Google right now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Even Stephen can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have to go on mine, actually, because I think I shared the ones on mine. So this is what it started out as, you know, mm -hmm. before they cut the walls open and we were still hopeful. And then this is what we ended up with. Wow. Mm. So. Oh my. Yeah, they've mm. been. Those are the two by fours right there. They had been at work there for a while, and then 
Mm -hmm. They moved the, what was left of the two by four. We realized that the beam was supposed to go all the way back to the brick there, and there's nothing there. Mm. It's just it's yeah. just gone. And it's like that. You can see right there, yeah. there's the brick that's fallen down. Oh, that's terrible. And it's like that on both on this side. There's one more up by the altar that we haven't checked yet. And then we realized today that at the base of it, it's even worse at the base. So yeah. Mm. Wow, wow, Stephen, you're right. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll try not to worry you so much. Well, uh, you know, I'm big enough to worry with two different congregations. I'm not concerned about that. It's just, you know, this, we knew going in that there would be weeks where one congregation would need more attention than the other. So that's why I was there today when I normally would be at St. Michael's because this was just one of those weeks where they needed more. Um, and I'm sure we'll have our weeks over at St. Michael's too, especially when it comes to somebody passing away or something. So, which I hope nothing like that happens. None of you have permission to die anytime soon. <laughs> All right. You got broad what, Barbara? I've been telling you, you got broad shoulders. Oh, uh, yeah. So. On a different note, since Lexi is going to big school, I, I've noticed that you've now started calling her Alexis. No, she only gets called Alexis when she gets on my nerves. <laughs> uh, well, I've noticed she's been getting called Alexis a lot, so I thought maybe it has something to do with her going to school. <laughs> she gets called Alexis when she gets on my nerves and hmm. um, or when she's doing something she's not supposed to, like Sunday when she decided to go sit up there in my seat and put her mask around her ankles like it was a pair of underwear that had fallen down um, which is why I was yelling at her as I was coming back up from communion trying to get her to take them off um, yeah so do you think it's going to get better anytime soon if you do you're mistaken <laughs> no I don't I don't expect it to get better but I'm trying to keep it in check for right now she's actually Hang on. Heaven is not ready for me. Hades is afraid I'm going to take over. God will call me when he is ready. Uh, Stephen says that, that heaven's not ready for him. Um, yeah, but she's actually, she, we had registered her with Berkeley County School District, but their return to school plan is basically good luck. Um, and so we looked for alternative options and Somerville Catholic School was willing to give her a scholarship. So she's going to be really? real Catholic. Um, so she'll get to wear her pretty little plaid uniform. and <laughs> <laughs> which, is so, which is so much easier than arguing every morning about what you're going to wear. She said something smart to me the other day, and I was like, all right, go ahead. That kind of attitude is not going to win you any friends with the nuns. <laughs> <laughs> Most Catholic schools don't still have very they, many. They don't, they don't have nuns either, but... Yeah. <laughs> they probably still have the rulers, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Any closing thoughts on our commandments or anything we've talked about tonight? Well, I just want to say again how nice it is to be with everybody, even if we're not together together. Yeah. Makes I a agree. big difference. I mean, no, uh, Linda, I agree. Mm -hmm. Same here. And I appreciate all y'all coming on here. I know it can be difficult at times, but thank y'all for being faithful to this. We've been, a, we've been a faithful group. We really have. This group has been uh, together now for, well, since Valentine left, and I don't know how long that is, maybe three years now. What do you think, Sandy? We were together before that as well. For you. Yeah, this is a yeah, strong but, group. But we stuck together when he left rather than disbanding. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I know he was there my first year of, of seminary because uh, Mike Wood, who used to be the associate over at uh, Monk's Corner United Methodist, Mike and I are real close friends and 
Mike would come to a seminary once a week and tell me about the, this evil guy named Valentine who was taking the Lutheran church for a ride. Uh, ooh. Little did I know that one day I would end up at that congregation. So, Yeah, he actually left and he left the beginning right after Easter in 18, I think it was. 18, 19, 20, so just two years. I feel like it's been longer than that. Yeah, but when he left, he was he was teaching uh, Bible study, and she was doing prayer circle, and we just decided that we were going to try to stick with having something for Wednesday night. We didn't have a leader at all, and we just stuck together. The the ones that were left, or several left with him, or at at not with him, but because of him, and um, it's it's been the same group just about. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you and Kathy both did a great job of holding things together. Uh, I know that you were teaching it when I first, or Kathy was teaching it when I first came, and then it went back to you. But well, uh, Barbara started, and then I, I would fill in when she wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, I, I was out for four week, four months, so she had a long time to practice. <laughs> when I broke my shoulders, yeah, mm -hmm. I had a hard time then, but. But we we worked together and it's worked out and we're still mm -hmm. here with God's help. <laughs> That's right. Now we can harass the pastor. <laughs> Get in line. I am so glad <laughs> that well, you decided. Thank God for him. So. <laughs> I really am. Mm -hmm. I never felt qualified to be the leader of the group, and I'm mm -hmm. just delighted that you're teaching us. Well, you no. did a good job, Barbara. Excellent <laughs> job. I was not trying to get kudos there. I'm just <laughs> to get it. But you, you uh, stepped right in and did it, though. So. <laughs> and kept yeah. and like you know, the hell us all together, like you were saying. So, which which was the main thing. <laughs> yep. We Let's did. Say thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, you're gonna. Just about on time this time. Yep, trying anyway. All right, so well, I, I think it's a sign that we're enjoying it when we go over. We went over fifteen minutes last last week, and my family was waiting on me, and they thought I thought you got over at t eight. I said, well, we were having a good time. <laughs> you know, told me talks a lot. All right, well, I'm going to stop recording.